Chapter 35 Mr. Bubble In the afternoon, Manuela showed up at the door with several bags. She came inside and wrapped her arms around me. She remained quiet as she unpacked the food and prepared dinner. The smell of chicken enchiladas filled the room. Manuela walked into the bathroom and filled the tub. I saw a pink plastic bottle, and suddenly the tub filled with bubbles. Come on, girl, it's time to wash some of the sadness away. Jump in. The water was hot and soothing. If I closed my eyes, I could feel Grandma's touch. From the kitchen, warm smells tried to replace the sadness in the room. I could have wrapped the feeling around myself for days, breathing in the scent of safe and comfortable. A new towel appeared over my shoulders. It felt thick and scratchy as I dried myself off. Manuela combed my hair in silence, just like Tessa. I had heard the name so many times. It was like a ghost floating in and out of the park. Are you finally going to talk about her? Tessa was my niece. I know that part. Where is she now? She disappeared. She might even be dead. Gang initiation, problems at home. I grew very close to her when she started having problems with her mother. But it wasn't enough. Silence. What could I say? No one ever went to jail. No one talks about it. And I find myself looking for her everywhere, said Manuela. I know how you feel. I felt the sorrow of her grief. I wondered if I would be doing the same thing. Papa had died, but it didn't hurt like it was supposed to, because I had been mourning him for so long. Manuela shook her head. But today isn't about my loss. We have to concentrate on you. You are here. Tessa is not. And she'll probably never come back. Out in the kitchen, Mama rummaged through the other bags. She had finally gotten out of bed. Manuela left me in the bathroom. She hugged Mama tightly. I'm sorry. Lo siento. Maybe now we can help. Mama's tears welled up again as she leaned into Manuela's soft shoulder. Gracias. But I don't know what to do. He's gone. I didn't either. Even though I was clean and the kitchen was full of warm smells... The faint aroma of garbage was still in the air. Outside, Mr. Mann put another bag of donuts on our stoop. He also laid a braided string cross next to it. Chapter 36 Free Fall Mama looked so sad that her eyes were dragging on the floor. She barely moved inside the house. I was stuck somewhere in between. Should I just give in and cry, or should I do something to prove all of this wrong? Maybe this is what I deserved? Papa couldn't be dead. How could he be dead if we had come all this way? Jorge knocked at the door. Hola. He spoke in a low voice. It was the way my papa had talked to the birds with broken wings as he placed them back into their nests. Manuela waved him. Mama looked out the window, tears in her eyes. Thank you for everything. I don't know what to do. Where do I start? How do I even find the body? said Mama. The body. The name of it was horrible. Papa was not a body. He was a real person, flesh and blood. No, don't worry about that right now, said Jorge. I'm not sure how to tell you the news. I sensed Jorge knew something we didn't know. What do you mean? asked Mama. I mean, I'm not sure that you are ready to hear about what happened, said Jorge. I was tired of not knowing. Papa had been gone for so long. I needed to know just so I could feel something for him, to shake off this numbing cold that was taking over my body. I want to know, I said. It was easier to pretend to be strong than to wilt in the corner. I had built a brick wall around myself, and I clung to it for support. Jorge looked at me. No, I'm sorry, you are too young for this. Why don't you take a walk or something? I was furious and felt like hitting something again. Too young? You mean I'm too young to think I'm going to die on the back of a truck or to take care of my mother or to earn money for my family? Manuela approached me. I know you're upset, but I didn't want her pity either, so I lashed out in whatever way I knew how. I'm not Tessa, and no amount of babying me will make it better that she disappeared. Manuela held her face like she had just been slapped. You know she disappeared after the gang thing. She dealt drugs. We couldn't even have a funeral, not even a goodbye. 
My father didn't do any of those things. He was just a worker, and he didn't do anything wrong. Where is my goodbye? Jorge and Manuela's eyes grew large with horror as I screamed my version of the truth. But shouting wasn't enough to quell my anger. I know I'm here in America, where everything is supposed to be better, but it isn't. I want to live in a place that doesn't smell like garbage. I want my quinceañera. I want to be 15 again. Mama had covered her eyes, and tears dripped onto the table from between her hands. I want to know, I said. It's what I have left. The truth won't make this easier, said Jorge. My mother finally raised her head. Please, we both deserve to know. Jorge let out a large sigh. I spoke to the family Arturo stayed with for a few weeks. Apparently, he fell from a large building where they didn't have much safety equipment. Several of the men who stayed in the area saw the accident. They think the company dumped him by the work hall. Mama turned white. They dumped him? Dead? The company worried the construction site would be shut down because of the illegals. All of the other men left the site because they were afraid. The owner threatened that he would turn them into immigration, said Jorge. La migra? Is this why no one would talk? Jorge continued. The family who was renting a room to Orturo says that all of the men have left the area. She didn't even know which work site. It's just a rumor to her. A rumor? Then this story might not be true. Papa could be alive. But where is my husband? Did they bury him? asked Mama. I felt my feet starting to burn. The earth began to shake, preparing to swallow me. The woman said she wasn't sure if the story was true. But I called the city morgue. If it's him, he's buried nearby. Buried. Buried. No. How could this happen? Is it really him? asked Mama. At any moment, I would be gobbled up. I felt like a piece of glass falling from the counter, shattering on the tile. The local police never did much of an investigation. The story is all over the work halls because the men told me the same version. Every few months, a body is dumped there. The workers think it's the companies. The police think it's drug dealers. This happens every day. It's not even news. I'm so sorry. There was hope. Dear God, please don't let Papa be dead. So maybe Papa isn't... I'm sorry. The woman at the mission gave me this. She said it was with his things. It was a Western Union receipt with the word Cedula written on it. It was wrapped around a small picture of Mama, Grandma, and me. Chapter 37. Frozen. It was true. Papa had only one picture of us. He would never leave it behind. Angels did let things fall from the sky. What have we done to deserve this? I said to the ceiling as if God might answer me. On one hand, a huge weight of my expectation had been lifted. Here was the answer. Papa wasn't a promise breaker. But a huge sadness crept into my shoes and was crawling up my legs like a hairy spider. I couldn't move or the monster would bite with poisonous wrath. Papa, gone. Papa, gone. I felt Jorge lift me from the chair and place me into bed. I remember Manuela brushing my hair with her fingers. I didn't have the energy to fight. Time twisted in hazy circles. Was it afternoon? Had months gone by? Tell me about Cedula, I heard Manuela ask. My lips were moving, but it wasn't me talking. Someone else's voice knew how to answer the questions. We lived in an orchard with grapefruit. My grandmother has owned it for more than twenty years. My papa was born there, I said. That sounds nice. Where is your grandmother now? asked Manuela. In Cedula, waiting for papa. We sent her money from Western Union. We wanted her to come and be here when we found Papa. I see. Do you have a phone in Cedula? No, we lived outside the town. I know Hector has a phone in his office. Who is Hector? How come I've never heard of him? Oh, he runs a bank. We became friends because I went there every week. I felt her fingers rubbing small circles into my back. Grandma would do this whenever I couldn't sleep, her gentle padding lulling me to sleep. How did you come? I asked her. Oh, sweetie, I didn't come to the States. I was born here. My grandmother came across a long time ago. Tell me the story, I said as I closed my eyes. 
She murmured the way Grandma used to whisper to me. She came like lots of people through the river. She lived with Jorge and me for five years before she died. Would you like to see a picture of her? Manuela opened her purse and brought out a color picture. The woman had white silvery hair like Grandma and deep brown eyes. She could have been Grandma's twin sister. Manuela, she looks like my Grandma Isabel. I realized that I didn't even have a picture of Grandma. I had been carrying her around in my head. I missed everything about my grandmother and her silly grapefruit recipes. It seemed all fruit made me sad or nauseous since the mango incident. Manuela, would you look for Flora? I would really like to see her, I asked. Sure, honey, just get some rest, she answered. My eyes closed. I dreamed of sweet-smelling trees and fingers combing through my hair. Chapter 38 Unmarked I woke up to Mama's clanking in the kitchen. Fresh donuts sat on the table. I forced myself to sit up. Mama, why didn't you wake me? We'll be late. Work had been engraved into my head. No work, no money, no nothing. No, Jorge and Manuela are taking a few days to get everything ready for the new restaurant. I think they went to Nueva Laredo to buy tables and chairs. So what do we do for money? I asked. Jorge left us some. He told me not to worry, just to rest. I didn't want to rest. I wanted to see Papa's grave. Mama, did Jorge tell you where Papa was? Mama stared at the sink. Yes, it's up the road a bit. We can go by bus. I tried to ask for directions to the cemetery from someone who didn't speak Spanish. The black woman in the shop sneered at us. I don't speak none of that Spanish, so you'll just have to find someone to translate. You should learn to speak English. This is America. We bought flowers at the market. The loud, playful music seemed all wrong today. Once again, we were in a place that was all wronged for us. The bus wouldn't come for an hour, so we waited in the park. There was no sign of Flora, and I wonder if she had disappeared out of my life, too. Mama pushed me on the swings. I wished I could swing high enough to fly away to Mexico, but my wings never sprouted. I spun Mama around in the merry-go-round. I saw her frown over and over again. The swimming pool was closed for cleaning, and the heat was exhausting. As we boarded the bus, I realized I would never have another birthday with my father. I wanted to make myself stop loving him, because maybe then the pain would go away. When we found the cemetery, we had to ask directions from a groundskeeper. After walking deep into a quiet area, we saw the headstones change from marble to flat stones of concrete. I'm not sure which one he is, said the groundskeeper, pointing to a flat area that had recently sprouted small blades of grass. We sat in the full sun until our backs burned and mixed sweat with our tears. Papa's grave didn't even have his name. I kissed the ground and left my leather sandals with him. They didn't fit me anymore. I wanted to give Papa something of myself. Mama didn't notice my bare feet. I guess she didn't have anything left either. I love you, Papa, I whispered, and we walked back to Quitman Street. Chapter 39 Spitting and Stealing Two days later, resting grew old and boring. Mama continued to lie in the bed, but I felt like a caged tiger. I walked to the cemetery. It was a long hike on a bumpy, cracked sidewalk overgrown with weeds. I didn't mention to Mama where I was going, and I left my purple flip-flops under the bed. She was lying face down on the mattress, crying when I left. We hadn't moved from the apartment in two days. I was suffocating in the misery. I wanted Keisha or Florida because I could talk to them in ways I could never talk to Mama. I was ready to open my mouth and let it all spill out. Jorge and Manuela weren't home from Nueva Laredo yet. Time stood still in this sticky, sad place. Large trucks zoomed by on my walk. They were going too fast for this street. The sidewalk sloped toward the curb, and I could feel the hot rush of wind as the trucks passed by. Gravel smacked my legs and bare feet. Ants I passed seemed to slow down under the sun's constant glare. My head was hot, but who cared? I did. Freshly cut grass bloomed in the air. I could hear the busy freeway beyond the trees. I could see the black iron fence running down the road to the left. On top of the gate was a white concrete angel looking at me with sad eyes. This isn't it, I muttered to her. 
At the back of the cemetery lay lots of little stones. I wasn't sure which one I was looking for. I hoped something would look familiar, and my sandals would be the markers. I passed hundreds of grave sites with fancy marble stones, small trees or benches. Poems and names were written on the side, but I wasn't interested in collecting the sad words of dead people. At the back of the cemetery, hundreds of tiny headstones lay sprinkled in the grass like stones in the street. Nothing looked familiar. I walked down several rows, and when I was sure no one was looking, I stole a few flowers from different graves. I'm sorry, I whispered to the headstones. I'm sure you don't mind sharing with someone who died with nothing. I had now turned into a thief. The words scared me. Papa died with nothing. He died alone. Those people threw him away like trash. There were no names on the stones. A small chapel stood in the back. Maybe this was a good time to rest. Maybe this would be a good time to pray. The door of the chapel was locked. No one was around, so I sat on the steps for a while with the flowers wilting in my hands. The shade of the tree let sunlight dance through them and make hazy pictures on the concrete. After sitting for a few minutes, I realized how tired I was. I stood up and tried the door again. I needed it to be open. Hello? Is anyone there? I called. The thorns from the stolen roses pierced my hands, so I threw them down to the ground. My palms throbbed in pain. No one answered the door, and I didn't care how much my hands hurt. Where are you? Open up. I need you. I need to talk to you. I beat on the door. Why did you throw them away? Why have you left me here all alone? The wind blew through the trees in a gentle rhythm. I needed answers, and God wasn't giving me any. Angels don't come out of the sky. They hide inside locked churches. I hate you. Do you hear me? I hate you. I took the postcard out of my pocket and tore it to shreds. Bits of paper fluttered away in the summer breeze. I spit on the steps of the church and walked home. I felt the booming of the bass, the high triplet of a whistle. I didn't pay attention. Hey, Tessa, where are your shoes? A teardrop was tattooed into the corner of his eye and a star on the crook of his hand. Okay? I turned my head to see a suave-looking man hanging out the window of a black Monte Carlo. I haven't seen you in a long time. Get in. I'll give you a ride. Tejano music sang from the car. I had to pick up my feet in a fast dance to keep them from burning on the concrete. I shook my head no and continued to the corner. Come on, Tessa. We could have a little party. He pulled the car around, blocking me from crossing the street, like last time. There was another teenager in the car. I could see his shiny hair as he opened the car door. We didn't know you was back in town. Let's rumba like last time. He pulled at my arm. No, I said, shaking my head. You're confused. I'm not her. The driver leaned over to show me an ID card from his visor. Sure it is. Here's your picture. It was my prize, but I never thought you would be brave enough to show your face around here. I leaned in. It was a Texas driver's license with what looked like my picture, but the name said Contessa Ana Villarreal. I reached for it when I felt them pull me into the car. Come on, chica. It was so much fun last time, but we never got to finish. The oily-haired boy slid in next to me and closed the door. The driver moved his hand up my leg. My brain defrosted and a voice filled my head. Get out of the car. I hit his hand away, but he dug his fingers into my thigh. What? You don't like it no more. You loved it last time. Last time? I heard the voice again. Get out. Escape. Survive. I pulled the gear shift as hard as I could, and we all jerked backward violently. I punched at the horn. My feet kicked at the other boy, but it seemed I could only reach the dashboard. The voice grew louder. Run. The driver lashed at my face. I kicked again, and the car lurched up and over to the side. I was now on the floorboard. The left side of the car was jacked into the air. Hydraulics. The car was jumping in different directions. An automotive tango was making us into passenger popcorn. Fuerte, be strong. I was tangled into the passenger's legs, but I couldn't reach the door handle. His ankles held me down into the alcohol-soaked floorboard. Fight. 
I suddenly realized this was not a voice of a patron saint. Today, it was my father's voice. Fight. I sunk my teeth into his Achilles heel and kicked with all my might. The car lurched again. The horn blared. Curse words bounced into the air in a blur. I reached the handle and fell out of the car. The giant anthill boiled in front of me. I reached down and scooped. Small red dots engulfed my hands as I threw the dirt into the Monte Carlo. I scooped again and again, throwing, cursing. You won't do to me what you did to her, I screamed. More ants, more swearing, until the car sped away. I heard howls in the distance. I could see them slapping at themselves as the car turned the corner. I smacked the ants off my hands, arms, and feet. Angry welt rose on my arms and legs. At my feet lay Tessa's ID card. I picked it up and ran the rest of the way home.